to the last episode of this month for 1986. This is the last month that we have our special guest, uh, Rick Herter, on with us today. Um, of course, don't need to go through the normal spiel, as if you are a Carried On listener, you already know it. You're an independent show, going every month, pick a different year, every week is a different topic. Uh, as far as updates go, we are going to be doing a segment that has to do with dads, to help promote the show as well as other things too. Uh, you can actually find the link for our shop below to check out the t-shirts. Um, so if you are in the Lakeland, Tampa, Orlando area, be on the lookout for any updates and such because we will be uh, going out into the malls and everything. So uh, make sure you follow us on all social platforms as well as uh, you know YouTube as well, podcasts and everything of that nature because uh, you may want to meet up with us on one of those days. Other than that, again, shop below for the uh, the store because all proceeds go to the production of this show as well as independent movies and stuff like that um and without further ado we'll go ahead and jump start but before we go to of course 1986 and do back in time once again we have mr rick herter on the show with us and rick how are you doing today i'm doing great todd how are you doing Doing good, doing good. Um, I know last time uh, that we have been speaking, uh, wanted to do a fun fact from your career as well as or life story. And before we jumped in back in time, didn't know if you had like a fun fact uh, from yourself personally or even a story that you wanted to share. Uh, Yeah, you know, this is kind of a funny and it's a flying story. It's early in my career uh, and I call it the jelly donut story. And uh, I was on a, on a flight with the uh, Michigan Air National Guard. It was back around 1987. And it was my first, what we call my first uh, tactical fighter type of flight. And uh, we, uh, the mission was scheduled to, to take off right after noon, right after lunch. So the pilots uh, that were going to fly the mission, there were four airplanes besides the one I was going to be in. So there were five, five of us. And uh, the guys, uh, the pilots come in and they're eating kibasa sausage, and jelly donuts, and diet cokes, and the normal kind of lunch stuff you, you might find in a college cafeteria or fighter pilot lounge or whatever. And then shortly after that, we briefed our flight, went out to the jets, and took off. And unfortunately, the weather that day wasn't so good. So the jet I was in was the first jet off. And, uh, you know, with the nerves of my first flight, it was after lunch, you know bad weather so we got above the cloud deck and we kind of turned and just flew a big circle for about five minutes while we waited for the other four jets to join us and in that time i really started getting sick and uh you know we have to we have to wear an oxygen mask over our face and and we talk inside that oxygen mask is a is a microphone and the speaker and right behind my my shoulder here you can see my my helmet uh popped up there but uh, at any rate, it's not easy to sometimes get your mask off, especially if it's your first time flying and you're nervous. And we were, we were rolling and we were doing some maneuvers and I started to get sick. And, and the airplane, we went up and we rolled the airplane like this, inverted. And as we were starting to roll back around, my jelly donut, the, the lunch I ate was about right here. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get I couldn't get my mask off in time to get my air sickness bag up from my mouth. So I, I uh, got sick in my mask. Well, <laughs> because because the microphone is in there and my pilot can hear everything that I say, as he can hear everything I say, of course, he could hear me getting sick in my mask. And so he looked at me and I could tell he was now starting to get sick. And uh, so we have, we have a switch on the, on the stick in the jet, and it basically goes between what we call cold mic and a hot mic. Hot mic is when, in that position, you can hear whatever's being said or talked about. Cold mic is a situation where you have to press a button to talk. So mm-hmm. you know, at that point, you know, as I'm getting sick, my pilot says, hey, Rick, go to cold mic so I don't have to hear this. So, uh, but it was, it was funny. I, I got sick. I finally got my mask off. I got it cleaned up and, you know, put the thing back on my face. And we flew the rest of the mission, but that's my, that's my jelly donut, uh, my jelly donut uh, story for you. 
<laughs> that, that's actually really funny because throughout the stories that you shared, you never talked about once getting sick. You yeah. started talking about, you know, getting close to being right. sick, right. but the way that you played it off is, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm good. Don't, yeah. I don't get sick. And next thing you know, you tell the story about, yeah, listen, that jelly donut, it yeah, hits you. Jelly donut <laughs> will hit you. It will, it will take a toll on you if you're in the wrong position with that jelly donut. <laughs> Well, I mean, let that be a lesson to, I guess, everybody not to have a jelly donut before a flight. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Especially if your pilot's going to fly upside down. Or something. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and jump back, back in time to 1986. Uh, Rick, you ready to jump back? I am. Absolutely. Let's do this. Okay. Man in time. And welcome to 1986. And this week, of course, we are going to go over the top grossing movies. Uh, the list here comes from boxofficemojo.com, uh, as well as the information, as usual, comes from IMDb. Wanted to make sure that it's a reliable source to provide you reliable information. Some of the honorable mentions for 1986, a lot of them were some heavy hitters, just like in the past of 1989, uh, 1995, some of the really well-known popular ones, and since uh, one is The Color Purple, another is Star Trek, four, The Voyage Home, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Stand By Me, which fun fact about Stand By Me is since it was written by Stephen King, um, from my knowledge, this is the only movie that of Stephen King's that he's actually thought did perfect. That was exactly to what he liked, what he enjoyed, and directly from the book. Um, another one is Rocky IV, Back to the Future, Song of the South, which is a very a uh, controversial movie from Disney directly um, as it depicts, you know, slavery and everything like that. But uh, as I tell everybody, not only in my life, but, you know, viewers and such, uh, biggest thing to take away from any sort of publicity about movies and stuff is just watch it for yourself. Um, for example, there is a movie uh, that was debuted in the White House. Um, and during the time, it was, you know, okay during that time period. However, now when you watch it, and even some back then when you watch it, it was very controversial. Um, I, I believe it was Birth of a Nation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was a Democratic president during that time period, and he showcased it. And if you know anything about the original, it's it it's very controversial in the sense of what it depicts. Um, but again, watch it on your own. Um, I'm not a fan of it for what the type of movie it is, but go ahead and watch it. Um, and kind of went on to the point of Song in the South. Again, watch it yourself. Create your own opinion on it. Uh, another one is Howard the Duck. Um, and then another one, and the last one is Little Shop of Horrors. Now, the number one gross movie of that time period was none other than Top Gun which raised $176.7 million, got a score of 6.9 out of 10 on IMDb. A, and what it's about is a call sign Maverick. The impetuous daredevil Navy pilot Ace is accepted into Miramars, Miramars if I'm pronouncing it, of course you could correct Miramar. me, yep. uh, elite fighter school. There, as an impulsive pilot, competes with the best of the best. He will meet the brilliant and highly competitive fellow student, Iceman. It was directed by Tony Scott. It starred Tom Cruise, Tim Robbins, Kelly McGillis, uh, Val Kilmer, Anthony Edwards, Michael Ironside, Tom Skerritt, and Meg Ryan. Uh, the Real Top Gun School, actually, uh, so fun fact, the Real Top Gun School imposes a $5 fine for any staff member that quotes the film. Another fun fact is Anthony Edwards is the only actor who didn't vomit while in the fighter jets. He probably didn't have a, uh, a donut. Didn't have and, then, a donut. <laughs> and then the last fun fact is Val Kilmer didn't want to be in the film. However, due to contractual obligation, obligations, he had, and it became one of his most iconic roles, which if I'm not mistaken, Val Kilmer was signed on for a three movie deal as well. Um, so I know later on in this episode specifically, we will go over, because you have some interesting fun facts of what you've experienced as far as, you know, being on set for the second one. So we'll leave it at that. No spoilers right now. But for my memory of Top Gun is it's a, an instant classic. Love it. I have the record of all the music on it. And it's definitely a movie that 
has captivated audiences everywhere. And I know it's played a big role in your life as well, right? It has, yeah. It's, uh, and, and in my generation, I mean, 1986, I, I had graduated from college in 1984. So um, when that movie came out, it really, one of the things that it did for the United States Navy was it really spurned recruiting. Uh, when, as a young person, point who's especially men, you go, man, I want to do that. I want to fly those jets. And, and so a lot of pilots and a lot of friends of mine that are now retired fighter pilots actually saw that movie, uh, went down the recruiter's office, signed up for the Navy, and within uh, you know a couple of years, they were actually flying the same jets off the same aircraft carriers that was flying itself. So it was, uh, it was quite a, uh, not only a cultural uh, type of, movie at the time, but it was also provided uh, uh, the impetus to a lot of wonderful uh, service people in their careers. So. Yeah, and it's an amazing movie just for uh, cinematography wise, camera angles, and, you know, I, I wish I was able to see it back in the theaters back then, but, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing the new one and hopefully yeah. the theaters. Um, <clears throat> so the second one is actually, uh, ironically and weirdly, is Crocodile Dundee. Was not expecting that. Uh, it did gross 174.8 million with an IMDb score of 6.6 .6 out of 10. It was directed by Peter Fairman or Feynman, sorry. An American reporter goes to Australia outback to meet an eccentric hunter and invites him to New York City. It starred Paul Hogan, Linda Kozolowski, uh, John. Malin, David Goldpill, Reg Reginald Bell Johnson. Ugh, those names are hard. Uh, the cast and crew slept in huts in a nearby miners' camp while shooting the Outback. The idea of the movie came from Paul Hogan's first visit to New York City as he felt like an outsider as people thought he was Scottish. Which is uh, pretty funny because even nowadays you get the same thing. So uh, I've seen the movie once. Uh, actually, no, I think I've seen it twice. Once when I was a kid and then my wife uh, reintroduced me to it. Um, it. It's funny. It definitely has, you know, that outback sense to it. Uh, I haven't seen any of the sequels. Um, my experience with it is, you know, watch the movie every now and then, but it's not like a go-to movie. Like how, uh, I, I, let's just put it this way. I would much rather watch Top Gun over and over then watch Crocodile Dundee. I don't know how you feel. Yeah, I, I think that the one thing I remember about that movie is there's a scene where, where uh, Crocodile Dundee is walking the streets of New York and he talks about really being out of place. And, and uh, again, back in the 80s, the crime rate was in New York City was very, very high. It's one of the highest crime rate cities in the entire, in the entire world at the time. And there's a scene in there where a couple of uh, uh, gang members come up to him, they're going to mug him. And one gang member pulls out a switchblade, you know, mm -hmm. knife with, you know, five, six inch blade. But Crocodile Dundee, I remember he looks kind of amused at this guy and goes, That's a knife? And he goes, Let me show you what a knife looks like. And he pulls out of a scabbard, a, you know, a knife that's about 20 inches long. And I mean, and he holds it up and goes, Now that's a knife. And, uh, and these guys turn tail and run, and, and you know I don't I don't remember a whole lot about that movie, but I do remember that scene for sure. Yeah, there are definitely some memorable moments. Uh, I mean, it would have to be if it spawned two other movies after that, right? Right, right. So it looks like uh, number three is the Karate Kid Part Two. It grossed one hundred fifteen point one million. IMDb score is six point one out of ten. Uh, it looks like uh, the premise of the movie is Daniel accompanies Mr. Miyagi to his childhood home in Okinawa as Mr. Miyagi visits his dying father and confronts his old rival. Daniel falls in love and inadvertently makes a new rival of his own. It was directed by John G. Vildson. Uh, it starred Pat Morita, Ralph Machino, Pat E. Johnson, Bruce Melmoth, Eddie Smith. Um, some fun facts, although set in Okinawa, the film was actually shot in Oahu, Hawaii. <clears throat> Another one is in the scene on the airplane traveling to Okinawa. While Daniel is asking about Tommy Bellaj, you see a uh, stewardess walk by in the shot who trips over something, but it and it's actually left in the final cut. So uh, basically, if you've ever seen the movie SWAT, um, 
it, it's the same premise, you know, when walking into the, uh, the zone where it's supposed to be blocked off, you see an old lady walking her dogs, and you see a couple of the characters trip over the lady and the dogs. That was actually not supposed to be in the movie. That was not scripted. It was some lady who actually stumbled upon the um, the the film site and who was just randomly walking her dog, but they decided to keep it in. So that, that was a little fun fact. Uh, were you a, a fan of Karate Kid at all? Or? You know, I, I really, I think I've seen it uh, on, you know, uh, Nickelodeon or something when my kids were younger. Uh, but now, you know, I was never, you know, I was, uh, the movies that I always kind of gravitated to were the action movies and some of the dramas. I, I didn't really, uh, don't really know much about that one, so I can't speak to it. speak to it at all. And that, that's okay. I know I've seen the, uh, the original back in the day. Um, I do remember but... seeing that one, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember the second or the third one. I know there's a third one. I do know that uh, I've seen the uh, the remake as well as with Jackie Chan and uh, Will Smith's uh, son as well. Um, so there's always that. Uh, but yeah, you know, I wasn't, it, it was okay. Like, I, I know it touched a lot of hearts of a lot of young kids. And I mean, it is iconic regardless, um, and it deserves every respect as, you know, every other movie that has been become iconic as that. Um, all right, so it looks like number four is Back to School. It grossed 91.8 million. It has an IMDb score of 6.7 out of 10. It looks, uh, the premise of it is to help his discouraged son Get through college, a fun-loving and obnoxious rich businessman decides to enter the school as a student himself. It was directed by Alan Meter and written by Rodney Dangerfield. It starred Rodney Dangerfield, Sally Kellerman, Burt Young, Keith Gordon, and actually, I didn't know this, but Robert Downey Jr. was in the movie too. Uh, a few fun facts. Like his character, Rodney Dangerfield was an acrobatic high diver in real life. Another fun fact is Diane's house is the same as the one used for the Doyle house where Jamie Lee Curtis babysat in the movie Halloween. I personally have never seen this movie. I've seen Roger Rodney Dangerfield played in other movies um, because, I mean, he is a very iconic comedic uh, actor and a comedy guy as well. But unfortunately, I've never actually seen this movie. Uh, is it something that you've actually seen? No, I, I haven't. Like like you, Todd, I've seen Rodney Dangerfield. I, I mean, the, the movie the Rodney Dangerfield movie that, is, uh, that comes to my mind immediately is Caddyshack. Yes. Uh, from mm -hmm. the 80s, you know, and, and I mean, he's, he's, he's a comedic genius in the movie. He's hilarious. He, he paired so well with, with Chevy Chase and, and uh, mm -hmm. Bill Murray. It, it's a terrific, uh, he plays a terrific role in that. But, but yeah, this, that, I never saw Back to School. So again, that, uh, yeah, like I do know that uh, the poster itself, it's one of those posters for the movie that if you see like, oh, yeah, you know, I have I know that poster. I've seen, you know, that picture, but it's I don't think it's one of those uh, movies that a lot of people have seen, which, you know, by the way, if you have seen it, whoever's listening, watching, leave a comment below. Let us know uh, in terms of have you seen it? What was your take? Have you seen any of these movies so far? How do you feel about it? Because as of right now, we are going to our last movie, which I'm a fan of, um, and that is Aliens. It grossed 85.1 million. Does have a score of 8.4 out of 10. Uh, basically, the premise is 57 years after surviving the attack on her space vessel, Ripley awakens from hypersleep and tries to warn anyone who will listen about the xenomorphs, except this time it takes place on Moon LV-426. It was written and directed by James Cameron, which the first movie was actually done by Ridley Scott. It starred Sigourney Weaver, Michael Bean, uh, Ben Bean, uh, Carrie Henn, Paul Reisner, and the late Bill Paxton. Uh, fun facts are in both the standard and special edition versions, the 15 minutes countdown is indeed 15 minutes. So didn't know that, that's cool. In a deleted scene, a portrait of Ripley's daughter is of Elizabeth Inglis, Inglis. It's I-N-G-L-I-S. It's actually the mother of Sigourney Weaver. 
This was eventually restored in the director's cut. Um, I'm a fan of Aliens. I'm also a fan of Predator as well. Um, I think Aliens definitely has um, a take on it to the point where, you know, it's iconic all on its own. It's one of those movies that came out in, was it the 80s or the 70s? I want to say the 70s. That it came out in the 70s. No, 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 no. I think it did come out in the 80s because why would the second one come out like a, a decade later? Um, but I mean, Alien, I'm a big fan of just because of the originality of it. Um, during the time, I don't think there was anything like it. Uh, the Xenomorph character is iconic, uh, though the Predator, uh, fun fact, the Predator is not supposed to look like he does now, as in the original one, uh, they had him in a lobster suit. So that, that was a little funny. Um, but are you a fan of Aliens? Yeah, I, I, that, the first Aliens actually came out in 1979. Uh, okay, so, so you're insane. right. So you're right. 1979, 1980, right there. Um, it was kind of uh, a surprise that it was, you know, waited six years before yeah. the sequel came out. You know, usually a sequel follow up, in, you know, a couple years too, maybe three years. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I, I I love the Aliens movies. I love the Predators movies with Schwarzenegger and, and you know the cast uh, that that uh, played those films. Uh, love. You know, I think Sigourney Weaver, the 79 version, I think that may have been, uh, might have been her breakout role. You know, I could be wrong on that, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, who can, who can forget at the end when the entire crew has been pretty much wiped out? She's on her way to back to Earth. She's survived everything, and uh, she's in the escape capsule, and she kind of lays back to like, <laughs> finally take a deep breath, and all of a sudden that thing you know, is right there with her, right in the escape capsule. Now she's got to, got to fight this thing, and uh, and she eventually ejects it out into space. But uh, yeah, great movies and, and the follow up film. Uh, I was always a Bill Paxton fan, so I really really enjoyed him, and uh, and a lot of the movies that he did. Uh, so yeah, great 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 film. And, and it's completely different from the original too, because the yes. first one is more horror based. A lot yeah, more jump scares yeah. and everything like even in the first one where the alien comes out of the chest of the the guy that right. was not scripted as far as everyone's reactions because uh i guess a fun fact on that um is ridley scott didn't tell anybody and how what's going to happen he just let it go uh, i believe he may have said something similar or something very like very lightly on what's going to happen but didn't say exactly what so when the alien pops out of the chest, I believe it was just that actor that knew what was going to happen. Everyone else had no idea. So when the blood splatters on Sigourney Weaver and a lot of the actors, their reaction was actually natural. That fear was actually natural, which is um, back in the day with the, uh, with the directors and stuff, even till this day, like a lot of directors do that. Like for an example, Stanley Kubrick, who did The Shining. Uh, that scene where the mom is trying to take out Jack Nicholson on the staircase and like she's screaming and crying that is actually a real reaction only because of the fact that they filmed that over a hundred times so they took that scene filmed it well over a hundred times and that reaction that she had is out of tiredness and out of just being because of course everyone gets tired and then at some sense you just get out of it so she's tired she's just done with the scene she doesn't want to do it anymore so that scene of her doing that is because of how she feels during that so that's just one fact but it's it's funny because of course as i said the first movie it was all horror this is all action so it's completely different um and then of course after that you had aliens you had aliens three <clears throat> and then i believe or did you have aliens Resur yeah alien three and then aliens resurrection i believe was that and then it kind of took a hiatus until prometheus came out which was a prequel to all the alien movies and then after that uh prometheus got a lot of negative you know uh feedback and stuff like that and so out came alien covenant which is a sequel to prometheus but still a prequel um and that brought the iconic look of a xenomorph back and kind of brought that genre back in a way too so i don't know if you've seen those movies but <laughs> yeah no those i i have not 
Yeah, th those are those are some good ones. Um, all right, so I guess this kind of jumps into um, the other topic that we wanted to talk about is the fact of the new Top Gun movie is coming out this year. Um, it's been postponed numerous of times due to COVID. Um, it's definitely one that Tom Cruise has been trying to get made for years. Um, and of course, Tom Cruise does a lot of the stunts and stuff. But the thing is, is we have no connection to Tom Cruise or to the actors or to the film production. But what we do have is we have Mr. Rick here, who's actually been on not maybe not the actual set. I don't know. He can fill us in, but he's been at the filming locations and has experienced some of that. Um, so I'll go ahead and let Rick take the uh, talking points on this, kind of describe his uh, experience and, you know, kind of fill us in on what happened and his take on life in the Top Gun 2. Well, I, I think before, you know, Top Gun 2 obviously is a, is a uh, continuation of the story from Top Gun 1 and, and to give folks a little bit of a background on, on the original Top Gun and how this whole, whole story came about you have to go back to 1983. And there was a magazine called California Magazine at the time, I, I believe it's still published, but it's kind of a, a lifestyle magazine uh, in California, Los Angeles uh, area. And, and uh, a gentleman, a writer by the name of uh, Ehud Yanni uh, had gone out, had been invited out to Miramar Naval Air Station, which was the home of Top Gun at the time. And uh, he toured it and had a chance to to interview the pilots, the commanding officer, and, and expose um, what the Naval uh, Fighter Weapons School is all about. When you hear the term Top Gun, um, it's referring to what is called the United States Navy Fighter Weapons School. And that's where they take you know top uh, fighter pilots from around the fleet, and they're usually young officers, or what we call junior officers. Uh, they go out there, they train them, uh, in weapons and tactics and kind of hone uh, an already sharp knife into a razor edge. And then after, um, basically at that time, I believe it was a five or six week course in the 80s, then those young officers go back to their fleet squadrons on board the, the aircraft carriers or at their shore stations. And then they become the training officers for those tactics and that uh, those weapons tactics and uh, strategy tactics and those types of things and teach to the rest of the pilots in the squadron so it's a it's it's how the navy takes the best of the best of, of training and then uh it's like a mcdonald's you reproduce that in different franchises all the way across the country and that's how the navy does it with, with their top uh top pilots in training so at any ways um the article I, I believe it was jerry bruckheimer that had seen the article and bruckheimer and don simpson were the two writers and, and the two uh, producers for the film. And so they read the article. The article was, was also had some amazing photographs that were literally shot by a guy by the name of C.J. Heatley, uh, call sign Heater. And Heater was a, an F-14 pilot and a, and a pretty doggone good photographer. He's an what you call an amateur photographer, but he'd done several coffee table books with his photography. And, it was really uh, those photographs and that story is what grabbed the, the producer. And then the director, Tony Scott, came on. Um, and then, of course, Tom Cruise and Val Kilmer, and they had a great cast list and, and told that story. Now, you had alluded earlier about the cinematography, which was amazing. And, and you know, this was before uh, computer graphics, CG, green screen, all those kinds of things. So if mm -hmm. you wanted to get um, you know, you did have models, you could put aerial models in the air to simulate explosions, and that, that's what they do in the, in the dogfight scenes, with what's called the MiG-31, I believe, uh, the black enemy jets. But back then, if you wanted to do aerial scenes, you mounted cameras to airplanes, and, and you had to put the airplane in the perfect position, um, and, uh, and it was all very, very hard work. Well, most of the movies, most of flying movies and history movies that have been done in the last 15, 20 years, they've been using a lot of uh, computer graphics and green screen and those types of things. Um, and I think uh, you lose a lot of authenticity with that. One of, the cool, one of the cool things about uh, Top Gun Maverick, when Cruise was going to do this film, the budget was going to be 
astronomical in the, in the tens of millions of dollars because they were going to use all real jets again, mounting cameras, and now the high-end digital um, type of cameras uh, had, had the new technology was leaps and bounds of what they had back in the 80s. 84, 85, and then it came out in 86. So I had, in, 19, in the early 1990s, I had been invited out to Top Gun and Miramar, and I had a chance, uh, some of my artwork was actually on an exhibit there at the original Top Gun School at Miramar, where they filmed the movie for a good portion of the movie. And then in the 2000s, uh, the Navy moved the school from Miramar near San Diego to uh, the high desert of Nevada, to Fallon Airport. Air Station, hmm. Naval Air Station in Nevada. And one hmm. of the reasons they did that was because of the, uh, the airspace around San Diego and Southern California was becoming more and more crowded. Uh, there, were, there was a lot greater range, what's called range area, where the, the airplanes could fly and fight, simulate combat in their training in Nevada, in the high desert area uh, of Nevada and the ranges that also incorporate Ellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas. So. It was just a much better training area. The pilots were, you know, Fallon is a little tiny, little tiny town in the middle, middle of nowhere. So there was less distraction for the pilots when they got there. And, and the course then expanded to about a 12 week course now. Um, and I was actually just out in Fallon uh, as the filming for Top Gun Maverick was wrapping up. Oh, wow. So uh, I, I was fortunate enough the 50th anniversary class of Top Gun um, graduated. It was, uh, uh, it was 2019, like 2000, or uh, March, April 2019. And the class that was going to be the 50th anniversary graduate class uh, invited me out. They commissioned me to do a painting for the school. And so, wow. during, uh, so I was out there for the unveiling of the painting, which hangs. In the uh, headquarters building, as you walk into Top Gun, and the hangs there. And I had a chance to uh, to then attend their graduation party and their what we call a patching party, which is the night before graduation, where each graduate is given the, the coveted Top Gun patch. Uh, and then after that ceremony, we all go to the officers club and, and uh, you know, uh, have, a, have a few adult beverages and, and uh, you know, celebrate their success. And, and, but while I was out there, uh, filming had just wrapped for Top Gun Maverick. Uh, and some of the jets that were painted as the movie jet, uh, the movie jet that Tom Cruise will be seen flying in that movie was still there on the ramp, still painted with Maverick on the, on the canopy rail. And it was just something to see. Wow, that, that's absolutely amazing. So did you have any time or did you have any experience with anybody who was on set? Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I knew, knew several people out there, actually, the, the chief of public affairs, who is kind of the military interface with the movie people, uh, is a good friend of mine. And, and he was kind of a lead point guy with the producers, the directors, the, the actors, the film crews and everything. So, you know, the film crew needed something. In the Navy, he was kind of that guy that helped make a lot of those arrangements happen. Um, so, yeah, and he's, he had some great stories to share with me. And about some of the filming and, and some things that you'll see in the movie when it comes out. And the cool thing was um, the, the film crew or the, the director had actually had a, a very small group, I think there were 30 or 40 of the Navy fighter pilots that were out there at the time that participated in the movie and, and other pilots that, that were kind of off on the side on the, on the behind the scenes. And they showed us in the aerial aerial film that they had that they had captured and even the pilots that do this for a daily living you know fly it every day used to seeing the stuff they were they were blown away by what the director and producers and cameras were able to capture and even they said you know if, if, if this stuff makes it in the final cut it's gonna be really really impressive so you know overall the hopes are that top gun maverick will be every bit as good if not better than wow and see that's that seems like a pretty steep feat to actually climb but i mean in modern technology like you said like i'm sure they can hit it i mean 
especially in today's world with the speakers and the stereo system and everything in the theaters, like I, I'm looking forward to actually feeling like I'm next to a fighter uh, fighter jet. Like that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm the motions and the angles. And I guess what I really want out of this is while I'm watching the movie, I want to get sick. Like that's, that's the level I want to get to is I want to get sick. I may have a donut beforehand, but I want to get sick. So then that way, as I'm watching it, like I want those angles and those twists and those turns to make it feel like I'm actually there. I may have to go to a 4D theater where they have moving seats, who knows, but that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to. So, which with some of the stories that he shared with you, are you able to share any, or are those more of like classified that's, you know, DA? Well, well no, I, I mean, it was interesting because, you know, one of the things a lot of people don't know about, but Tom Cruise is a very accomplished, very seasoned pilot himself. As a matter of fact, after the original Top Gun, he, he enjoyed flying so much that he went on to his pilot's license. Uh, you know, much, much like, uh, you know, what, uh, oh gosh, I, I'm on a blank now um he played the role saturday night Fever. oh john travolta john travolta yeah, yeah after after that movie he went on to become a pilot and very common pilot as well but the cruise is so much so that he owns a world war ii fighter of people who are Boston, that is also wow. in the movie and he did a lot of the flying in, in his movies he's, he's helicopter rated so you know in, in mission impossible a lot of the movies the flying scenes, he's actually flying the aircraft. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Wow. So one of the other things, I mean, he's flown a lot of high performance aircraft, so he knows what it's like to feel G forces and, and the forces on the body when you very violent maneuvers um, mm -hmm. of these jets. And and one of part of the training for his fellow actors like Miles Tiller and, and some of the other actors that portray pilots for backseat reels, what we call weapons we call weapon systems officers rizzos in the back of the jets they all had to fly these airplanes and take training and, and i mean he he wanted before filming started he wanted his uh, his actors to know what it felt like so they all flew uh and got some some pre-film training uh, and and i think that's going to really do well in the film i think they'll look uh, very realistic in what they do and how they Oh, absolutely, because I, I love, um, what is it, method acting? Yeah, it's method acting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at Shia LaBeouf. In the movie Fear, uh, Fury, he actually pulled out his tooth to fit the role. So, like, method acting is um, what I feel is one of the best ways to act in some circumstances. Now, I'm not saying to it's good to lose weight, like, over 200 pounds, like Christian Bale did for one of his movies, and then gain, like, 200 more pounds, like, a week or two weeks later. Like, no, that's that's got to be unhealthy. But as far as, like, um, experiences like this, like how you were saying, like, you know, Miles Teller had to take training courses and stuff like that, and Tom Cruise made sure that everybody took training courses, like, the fun stuff to make sure that, you know, when you go into it, it looks real, just like what you're saying, like, a lot of nowadays, a lot of the flight simulations and stuff, it's all CGI based, but why not just have it practical, and that's the one thing about, for example, Star Wars, the one thing that George Lucas got hated on is the fact of the original series coming out, redone with a lot of cgi effects no we want practical stuff which is where force awakens kind of came in and did a lot of practical stuff same thing with this is it needs to be practical effects because that's kind of what the whole point is for movies right there were yeah there's some cgi elements that we're looking to escape realism like you know blade runner perfect example but in movie situations like this like we want to be able to be in the movie we want to be able to see real life experiences so i for one am excited for it just because of you know just knowing how much everybody had to do in order to play the part i mean miles teller i've enjoyed his acting um a lot i mean his acting was good still in fantastic four the remake but uh like whiplash you know he did a great part with whiplash with jk simmons um tom cruise same thing great actor and knowing that um miles teller is actually playing uh goose correct his son yeah he's playing the son of goose yeah miles teller is call sign is rooster and 
what what uh, what the listeners may not know is in military aviation, everybody gets a nickname. So uh, my my call sign, my nickname is Brush because I'm an artist. So you know, Brush kind of, kind of fits my role. But um, yeah, so so uh, Miles Teller is the grown son of Tom Cruise's original Rio radar intercept officer uh, uh, Goose, who was in the first movie killed in the first movie. And so there's kind of this uh, family dynamic reunion and tension as a result of that. You know, the other thing too is in the original movie, these guys like Cruz and, and, and Val Kilmer were all really young actors. You know, they're very, in their very early 20s. And now, you know, they're in their 40s, 50s, uh, pushing, you know, some of them probably even a little older than that. So they're going to be a lot more seasoned and uh, it's going to give the movie a, a, a different look. I know Val Kilmer Homer comes back as now maybe the Admiral. Mm -hmm. In the first movie, he's a young lieutenant, hot shot pilot. Um, but you know the story continues on. Where he has stayed in the Navy through the years and has worked his way up the ranks, and now he's going to be Admiral. That will be essentially Tom Cruise's boss in the next film. But um, the, talking about CG, you know, in the first film. The, the star of the movie, the airplane star of the movie, was the F-14 Tomcat. And the Tomcats, when the movie first came out, had only been in the fleet about 10 years. So they were still a fairly new airplane, very high tech. At the time. Well, now again, fast forward 25, 30 years, the Tomcats have all been retired. They were retired from Navy service uh, back in the early 2000s. And there is a scene, there's a couple of scenes in Captain Maverick where Maverick is flying an F-14 Tomcat. Mm -hmm. Now, since that airplane is no longer around, since the, all the airplanes, Tomcats still exist, are basically in museums. They had to, they took a museum Tomcat and used it filming and used some CG work in that airplane. Right there. So, wow. you know, I kind of misspoke in that, that there will be some CG, but it's very limited. And most of the flying scenes where the guys are flying the F-18 Super Hornets. That's all aerial sequence and it's all aerial photography. So that'll be pretty much as it is in that. Well, I, I want to see it now. I want to watch it now after <laughs> talking about it. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it makes me want to actually go buy it where I don't have to, you know, wait. But obviously, you know, I'm going to have to wait. But You'll, you'll want to see it on the big screen with the Dolby sound. That's, oh, that's Oh, yeah, hands down, absolutely. Well, uh, with that, of course, Rick, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on to the show, um, as well as sharing the stories and experiences, um, as well as you know sharing your experience on the set of Top Gun Maverick. Um, was there anything else that's uh, in the back of your mind that you wanted to share? No, you know, I, I'm I'm really it's been fun to talk to you about the, the movies of that era. You know, that was right to go back to college for me so it was a very it was a great time in life and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's certain things that really huge impressions on me certainly top gun and, and that has played into my career uh that movie a lot of guys went out to work and fly and became fighter pilots and i became a, an aviation artist in part because of that film and uh, have it, had a chance to fly with the navy and their fighters and, and uh and fly uh a lot of tactical, fun with the tactical fighter jets, and, and so I'm thankful for that for that film too because it really spurred something. So, you know, I'm excited for the new one. I think you're going to love it. I think everybody who sees it's going to just be blown away by it. And it's about damn time that the thing is finally. Been <laughs> We've been waiting for this thing for two years, and it just you know this whole COVID COVID thing, and, and uh, so you know we we Cruz figured he'd probably better release it before he's in rocker. Or, uh, or walking with a with a walker. So. Yes, yes. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show. It means a lot for having you here. Um, and before we go, go ahead and let everyone know where they can find you again. Yeah, so if you're interested in seeing some of my art, uh, you can find me both on Facebook and on Instagram at Rick Herter Art. Uh, you can also visit my website at rickherterart.com. So, uh, and if if your viewers uh, have questions, ever want to get in contact with me, they can shoot me an email or a private message. 
uh, through any of those uh, social media platforms. Fantastic. Well, Rick, thank you so much for coming on again, and thank you all for listening.